Hello, welcome and welcome to Translating Identity, uh, part of Meet the World uh, series and the Advanced German Translation Workshop organised by the British Literary Centre for Literary Translation, the Goethe Institute and New Books in German. And this evening, I have the great pleasure of introducing these three really wonderful panelists, um, Mitu Samuel, Priscilla Lane and Alta Price, and to celebrate two brilliant novels, two brilliant translations, um, A Thousand Coils of Fear uh, by Olivia Wenzel, translated by Priscilla Lane, and Identity by Mitu Samuel, translated by Alta Price. Um, so before we get into the discussion uh, and um, and questions, and I've got quite a few questions, I might have to turn them down. Um, I'm just going to go through a bit of housekeeping. Um, so if you have any questions yourself, there'll be some 10-15 minutes hopefully at the end for uh, for audience questions, please put them in the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little box saying Q&A. If you could put them in there please, rather than the main chat, that would be really, really helpful, so I can see them more clearly then. Um, and just uh, for information, this session is being recorded and hopefully it'll be, well, it will be uploaded later to YouTube so you can always watch it again at a later date or share it with uh, your friends. Um, so now to introductions. Um, Priscilla Lane uh, is an Associate Professor of German and Adjunct Associate Professor of African Diaspora Studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her book White Rebels in Black, German Appropriation of Black Popular Culture was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2018. Mitu Sanyal is a cultural scientist, journalist, critic, and author of two academic books, Vulva, which is translated into five languages, and Rape, which is translated into three languages and published by uh, Verso in English in 2019, and Identity is her first novel, which is very exciting, and hopefully asking some questions about that as well later. <laughs> and uh, Alta Price uh, runs a publishing consultancy specialised in literature and non-fiction texts on art, architecture, design and culture, and is a recipient of the Gutekunst Prize and Alta translates from Italian and German into English. So welcome to our lo lovely panellists. Um, and I think what I might do is, um, Firstly, just ask you both, Mitu and Alsa, uh, about how you came to kind of <laughs> work together. How did Alsa, how did you discover Mitu's writing? What were the first books you read by her? And how? what were your first impressions, I guess, of, of reading uh, Identity? Sure. Thank you so much. It's so great to see you all and to be here. I can tell you that I had first heard about Identity through German friends who were reading the novel. So um, they were reading it and said, you absolutely have to read this. Uh, so I did. <laughs> and then it was sort of a, a magical matchmaking process um, with the assistance of a French to English translator um, friend and, and colleague of mine, um, Jeffrey Zuckerman, who was in touch with the, the publisher who ended up acquiring uh, World English Rights and then, and then facilitating it also getting to V&Q. So that's the short short answer. Me too. <laughs> well, um, I actually um, I got to read a couple of um, translations. So so a couple of um, the first chapter. So and it was so clear that authors was so much more like I wanted than all the others. And so I said, I need to do it with her. And, and it was it was kind of nerve wracking because up until the last minute, they couldn't agree on the contract. And I heard later on what my publisher wanted to put in the contract. And I said, oh, I, I understand why you couldn't agree on that. But we were kind of, there was a grant for the translation and they had to sign before the deadline. And I think they signed the night before the deadline. Yeah, we made it. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm actually currently reading Volva, uh, which I was trying to get my hands on. It's It was published, what was it, first published in 2009, Me Too, I think? Oh, yeah, yeah, that was my dissertation. So that was my um, doctoral thesis and <laughs> I wrote about the Volva. And now people are kind of, oh, everybody's talking about the Volva. And back then, nobody did. So when I said to people, oh, I'm writing about the Volva, they asked me, what's that? Is that a river in Russia? Or is it a Swedish car? <laughs> I said, no, actually, <laughs> you'll be surprised. Yeah. 
And it's, uh, let's see, I, I was just, so I was just, you know, at a, at a translation workshop and actually one of, um, I, I met with so many amazing writers and translators. It's all, I'm still like processing this latest trip, but um, I met with a colleague who had actually read that book several years ago and his mind was blown. He said, it's, you know, ostensibly it, it, it's kind of an art history because you have great illustrations, but then you do this cultural sort of, um, uh, you know, exploring of this otherwise, you know, highly neglected for many of us every day <laughs> phenomenon thing that affects our life. So, yeah. yeah. There are loads of wonderful pictures of the vulva in the book and I insisted on that. And that was really difficult back then. So, oh, you can't do that. Yes, 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 you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. I really want to read this book now, actually. <laughs> it's definitely on my reading list uh, for sure. Um, oh, great. Thank you. I actually, I know I was, maybe I didn't say properly introduction when I read both these books really recently I was just amazed by the by the translation just just kind of how lively and how vivacious and how just because both both of these novels I can just tell when you read it you can tell this was a real challenge to translate oh I, I imagine it would, would have been a real challenge to translate but somehow that product is so effortless and you know really it's very much alive on the page um but anyway I guess We'll get get to the, how that all works a bit later, perhaps. Um, but but Priscilla, could you let us tell us a bit about how you came across across Olivia Vensel's work for the first time? How you came to to read, you know, um, a thousand calls of fear for the first time? Yeah, gladly. Um, so I uh, became familiar with Olivia's work back in 2015, so it was a while ago, because I'm currently working on a academic book about um, Afro German Afro futurism. And I was looking for texts that might fall under that umbrella. Um, and a friend of mine, Jamel Watkins, um, knew of Olivia's play, um, was it Mais in Deutschland und andere Galaxien? So corn in Germany and other galaxies. <laughs> and so she put me in touch with Olivia and we began communicating about that. And I um, invited Olivia to UNC. Um, so, and at the time she told me she was working on on a novel. Um, and so I knew like it was on the horizon, but I didn't know when it had come out. And then a friend of mine, who's a, a, a well-known translator for uh, German to English, Susan Bernofsky, she, you know, got a hold of the German and uh, wrote to me on Facebook, said, have you read this yet? This is, you know, amazing. You would love it. And so she sent me a copy and I knew as soon as I started reading it, you know, I'd love to translate this because it, it was just such a fun book to read. I didn't want to put it down. Um, and so, yeah. Um, oh, then eventually I, I did an academic presentation on the book and then um, uh, the people at a catapult saw my presentation and said like we can tell you really love this book and you've like thought a lot about it um and that's how the the um contract for the translation came about so wow that's really interesting though that you had that sort of academic slant on it that you're really reflecting on it really getting in deep into to how it works as as his fiction and then and then on the back of that to be to be able to just date it that's kind of kind of the dream <laughs> that's great definitely yeah oh wow um if you want, I was wondering if, if you could perhaps give us a, a taste of, of the novel now or give us a short reading um, of A Thousand Calls of Fear so, we, so everyone else can have a sense of what this amazing novel is about and how it, how it flows as well, because I think both the novels are very stylistically exciting. <laughs> um, anyway, yeah, that, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, gladly. Um, and the, the excerpt that I chose, it takes place on election night and today is the election in the U.S. So I thought it's, it's fitting to start that way. So, okay. Where are you now? A couple of days ago, I was in New York. On election night, I was sitting in a bar in Manhattan, a few blocks away from Trump and Clinton. Go on, go on. I'm talking to some British managers from Shell. We're drunk and in good spirit. Cheers. I've decided to be tolerant. I don't want to judge them. Surprisingly pleasant, eloquent men, we get along well. One of them says he's a feminist. Angela Merkel's policies are destroying Syria because no one is returning to rebuild their country. And Hillary Clinton has basically won. The other one, Keenick, is euphoric. He keeps saying, this is amazing, in a British accent. His deep voice and the melodious sound of the former colonial empire draw me in. 
Which detail are you leaving out? Which detail are you leaving out? And his ethnicity. What? His ethnicity attracts me, but it makes me uncomfortable to say that or to think it. Why? This is amazing, Keenick says. And with that, he means the atmosphere of this New York night, the election, the anticipation, perhaps even the feeling we all have that we're witnessing a historic moment. Around midnight, I follow him to his hotel. We're convinced that in the morning, the first ever female president of the USA will be confirmed. Around 3 a.m., we've drunkenly fucked ourselves to sleep. My cell phone vibrates, text messages from my friends in Germany. 9-11, 11-9, be careful. What the fuck? I turn on the television. Trump has just started his speech. Keenick wakes up and snuggles up to me. He has such smooth skin and smells so good. Is that coconut oil? We sleep together again while he pounds away with his meticulously trained manager physique. I can't take my eyes off the television. Keenick moans something. I can't understand it. So he says it again. This is amazing. This is amazing. I think Donald Trump's family actually looks shocked. Meanwhile, I'm on the 16th floor of a luxury hotel in Manhattan, getting fucked by a man whose company is systematically destroying the environment. And four hours later, in a plane to Durham, the nice stewardess serving cookies. Where are you now? Still in Durham. On a wall, someone has sprayed, Black lives don't matter and neither does your votes. Have you ever destroyed government property? Black lives don't matter and neither does your votes. I don't think that's proper English. I think that will stay there for a while. I don't know if these things will ever end or just get worse. In the US, I'm blacker than in Germany. This is amazing. Excuse me? This is amazing. The slave trade is the most successful business model in human history. Forced labor is still a breathtaking concept. Trading with enslaved bodies, the whipping, the rape, the lynching, I love that idea. In the English speaking world, there's a tendency towards exaggerated language. I would kill for the cookies they sell over there. In Germany, there's a tendency towards exaggerated violence. I would kill them if I could. People burn down asylum seekers' homes or they yell jump already to the refugees until they plunge to the ground from the windows. Or an 80 person lynch mob is chasing down random kids to stab them. I have to believe that these people live on the margins. I have to believe that the core of society condemns these attacks. Otherwise, the land in which I live distinguishes itself very little from the US. Otherwise, the land in which I live could soon vote the same way. Otherwise, the land in which I live would no longer be my home. What happens when you fall asleep? I fall. What happens when you wake up? Sometimes there's a, just a melody, a giggle, often just brief cold fear. Where do you feel at home when I'm asleep? What is the purpose of your stay? Where, here on earth? What do you dream of? What do you dream of? For a moment, I see something flare up, an image from history class, but more current, somehow newer and with drones. Instead of men in steel helmets, the faces of my friends, my dear friends, how they're running, ducking, falling, as if they were being kicked and hit by bullets, whips, fists, and bombs. Somewhere in Berlin, somewhere in New York, somewhere in Thuringia. My friends lying on the ground with severed limbs, covered in blood, with contorted faces. My friends between collapsed buildings. My friends with their eyes wide open, small flies circling them. And then? And then? My friends are a chapter in a history book that is slammed shut. Unemotional, objective, because everything happened so long ago. My dead friends as something that doesn't concern anyone today. My dead friends as a memory, a memorial on paper about which people will say, don't be so sensitive. That was the zeitgeist back then. All right, thank you. Wow, <laughs> that was really amazing. Yeah, and also just Thanks. hearing you hearing you read it out loud as well. Um, Obviously, I've read it, but when you hit, when you're really almost performing it, it becomes even more, I don't know, more moving, more alive. Um, and it's amazing to me. That, sorry, now you read it out loud. How many kind of different moods and tones there are? Because it, there are moments where it's quite funny, and the protagonist, the unnamed protagonist of the novel, can be very, very uh, witty. And then there's moments where I'm just like, you know, 
where there's real, where it's very frightening, really. And you have these real images of violence and, and it's all coming together and all these different kind of, sorry, oscillations of, of motion and mood. Um, but yeah, but how do you feel reading that now? on the day of the midterm, in the midterms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it feels familiar. It's the, the translation process was, you know, was a long one. Um, Olivia and I went over several versions and she gave me really great feedback. And, but I do, I do remember all the words. Like when I read it, I remember writing it and it, it very, it feels, you know, a part of me um, now. Uh, but I also think that not only was it a difficult book to translate, I feel like it would be a difficult book to, to record because there's so many voices. And as you said, you know, humor and violence and tragedy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's a labor of love. It feels like a child, <laughs> a, a translation like that. It is really exciting to see it done in, in the world. So. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. I mean, also reading both Identity and the Thousand Coils, Fear, next to each other. They're really, the two books really speak to each other in a lot of ways. And I thought, um, as you were just saying, you know, capturing all the different voices and the, the dialogue, the use of dialogue in a Thousand Calls of Fear, the protagonist kind of is talking to someone all the time and has these kind of conversations and you're not always 100% sure who they're talking to. Um, and so, similarly in Identity, you know, Nivedita, the main character in Identity, she is constantly talking to lots of different people in her head, to Kali, you know, the, the goddess, or oh, the god, <laughs> and um, is completely, you know, the, the voices coming in there are also incredibly kind of um, woven together and very sort of um, uh, multiple, I suppose. Um, but another thing that struck me, or was it another similarity, maybe we can get to kind of style in a bit, but um, was a kind of this, that sentence in the extract you just read, Priscilla, which is, oh, I feel black in the US and in Germany. And I think that's something that's true in identity as well, where Nivedita has her cousin, Priti, from Birmingham, and you have this kind of like the identity, not confusion, but it's more like it really makes you reflect on your own identity in a way. Both of the characters are forced to reflect on their identity compared to where they are in the world, isn't it? It's shifting all the time. So I don't know if, if Priscilla or Mito, you, you want to talk a bit more about that. Well, I think it's also got a lot to do with um, growing up black in Eastern Germany. In Germany, we haven't got a concept for that. So the East is white for us, which is bullshit. Um, I mean, especially knowing the history and that they had all these, I mean, there were lots of Indians, for example, in the East. And um, because India was the first country who accepted the GDR as a country and said, oh yeah, um, <laughs> we talked to you. So when we went to India, um, we never had to queue. So they all loved us for being Indian. So, you know, always treated us, oh, you come from India, how lovely. And so um, she tells a story that doesn't fit in the German idea of story. So that there have to be white skin hats in, in the East. And, and so it breaks with all these expectations. And when her, when Olivia's book came out, that was, a couple of years, four years, three years before my novel, and it was kind of like giving me permission to write my book. And um, it was incredibly important. And it was still, I mean, the, the, the literary criticism at the time was so harsh because they all knew this is a special book, but they couldn't deal with it. And they were always talking about, oh, is this real literature? Can you really do, are you allowed to do this? <laughs> Yeah, um, for me, I've, you know, reflected a lot on what it's like to be Black in the U.S. versus Germany, you know, based on my time spent in Germany, you know, shorter stays uh, since, what, 2001 was the first time I went to Germany. Um, but for me, it was really fascinating to see it from Olivia's perspective. So when she came to visit me, it was either 2015 or 2016. Um, that's another thing. I took her to the places she mentions in the book, right? So I took her to the restaurant in Durham. I took her to the monuments on the campus. And so hearing her kind of reflect on that. And, and I remember her saying, uh, you know, that it feels different to be Black here, you know, than it does in Germany. So for me, it was just, it was a nice moment of, I guess, like alienation, like kind of seeing U.S. race politics through the through the eyes of someone who didn't grow up here. Um, and I, yeah, I think another thing about identity that both books have in common is, is this kind of reflecting on like, well, like what kind of a person would I have been if I'd been born there, you know, born in Germany or in Birmingham, you know, just thinking about how location and time 
um, affects, you know, the identity that you eventually form. Yeah, completely. And, and nationality as well, isn't it? Like what, what is nationality even? But yeah, somehow it all comes in, <laughs> you know, it also can't really avoid it. And um, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's really, really interesting. Um, My fantasy when I was reading Olivia's book was that it was mm -hmm. kind of, there is an idea about blackness. It's it's a negative idea in, in the US, but there's an idea. And in, in Germany, it's still like, oh, you must be a visitor. So it, it, people can't process it. it. It's amazing. So there isn't a language. So all the language we use is imported. And that's very similar for, for my protagonist, Fanny Vidita. So um, in, in Birmingham, people recognize her as being Indian, as being Asian on the street. And in Germany, they always ask her, where do you come from? They go through all the countries because they can't place her. They don't know what to do with it. And if they can't place her, they can't deal with her. So in a way, she is invisible in this context. Yeah, well, Nibadita especially, she's always thinking about what and you know, what what she is, isn't it? And that Sarasvati, the, the okay, the the, cent, the central kind of story of the book is that Sarasvati, this incredibly charismatic lecturer, um, uh, it turns out that she is actually, even though she kind of performs, it tends to be kind of Indian. She is in fact white. Uh, and that's that, and the out, falling out of that kind of revelation is is what the book's about. But it's really also about Nivedita trying to trying to find herself, isn't it? Trying to say, what, well, where do I fit in in all of this? What does this mean for me? Um, yeah. What one of the things that resonated with me uh, about Nivedita was this kind of feeling like you're doing your ethnicity wrong. <laughs> like there's a right way to do it, and somehow she can't quite do it. And I I felt that way growing up because my parents are from the Caribbean. And so I was Caribbean American, but not had never lived there. So from the, my Caribbean relatives, it was like, you're not quite Caribbean. And from my American friends, it was like, yeah, but you're not really totally American. And so, yeah, this just like feeling of constant failure, like, and you kind of look for a model, someone you can look up to who's figured it out. Yeah. And it's not only, she's a feeling as a failure and to be authentic she would have to be a cliche which is which also feels wrong so she can't do it right whatever she does she's always in the wrong so to speak yeah poor Nibadita <laughs> yeah it's not easy and, so, and it's similar for, for a thousand calls of fear you know the main protagonist her father is from Angola and you know oh I'm half Angolan but you know but also that connection to that country is fraught complex is she really, you know, what, to, to what extent is she really Angolan and all that kind of stuff? And um, yeah, so, but yeah, so I, I feel like we can go right down a rabbit hole. This is really, <laughs> really interesting, uh, interesting stuff. But maybe this is a good point to to introduce sort of the next next reading. Um, I don't. I thought we'd have a sort of short reading in in German from me too, and a, and a short reading in English uh, from from Alta. So up to you guys. Who who wants to go? Who wants to go first? Me too. Do you want to go? Do you go ahead? Um, okay, then I start off with a very short reading in German. So okay. I start with the. Actually, no, I'm doing something else. I'm, oh, I'm we're not switching going it up. To do what I said. I got Switch it up. Throw me a curveball. <laughs> now I'm um, I'm going to do um, the taxi scene. So uh, Nivedita is. Um, um, Nivedita is taking a taxi home because her, hus her husband, her, her boyfriend has just left her again. This is what he does throughout the book. And so she's so heartbroken that she takes a taxi, although um, taking a taxi for her is in the same category as um, inland flights or as Gwyneth Porteris. This smells my, like my vagina candle, even though vaginas don't smell. So um, vulvas do vaginas don't, so the candle should be called This Smells Like My Vulva Candle. <laughs> You're welcome. And so the first, first thing the taxi um, driver asks her, where do you come from? And she answers, I was poor. And you got to, you should know. That. So Nivedita's mum's family is from Poland, like everybody where she grows up. And um, her father comes from India and she has got, um, her, her mother's called Birgit, her father's called Jackdish, and her cousin Preeti comes from Birmingham. And it's real. <laughs> And not a coconut like Nivedita, which is what her cousin always calls her. And Nivedita answers, aus Polen. Aus Polen, fragt der Taxifahrer. Aus Polen, bestätigte Nivedita. Und wo kommt die Mama her? 
aus Polen, aus Polen, aus Polen. Das Taxi fuhr durch die Unterführung Hüttenstraße und sie waren in Oberbilk und damit zu Hause. Und der Papa aus Indien kapitulierte Nividita. Das ist ja eine originelle Mischung. Nividita bezweifelte, dass das bei der Entscheidung ihrer Eltern für ein Kind eine Rolle gespielt hatte. Wir würden gerne einmal möglichst originell mischen. Außerdem war im Ruhrgebiet die Mehrheit der Bevölkerung sowieso in irgendeiner Generation polnisch. Birgit war eine geborene Schimanski. Das hat Nividita als Kind immer für eine besondere Ironie gehalten, da Birgit Anand dem berühmten Horst Schimanski so überhaupt nicht ähnelte. Doch mit zunehmendem Alter, also seit ihrem ersten Freund, war ihr klar geworden, dass der himmelblauäugige Tatortpolizist Schimanski mit seinen weichen Trenchcoats und den harten Sprüchen genau die Sorte Mann war, die Birgit attraktiv fand. Rauchen wie Simon und saufen nicht wirklich wie Simon und Deutsch wie Simon. Und Nivedita begann zu rätseln, wie Birgit und Jacques de Chanand jemals zusammengekommen waren. Doch für Birgit war Tautor Schimanski nicht deutsch. Ich kann mich noch genau daran erinnern, wie ich ihn das erste Mal im Fernsehen gesehen habe. Das war 1979. Nee, 81. Für Birgit war genau eine relative Angabe. Ein polnischer Kommissar. Du kannst dir gar nicht vorstellen, welche Vorurteile es damals gegen Polen gab. Wie viele Polen braucht man, um eine Glühbirne auszuwechseln? Ich wette, die Glühbirne wird geklaut. <lacht> dass ein pole -Kriminal hauptkommissar sein konnte und nicht krimineller, das war... Wir haben noch echten Rassismus erlebt. Es ist so toll, dass es so etwas heute nicht mehr gibt. Jedes Mal, wenn Birgit diese Geschichte wiederholte und sie wiederholte sie ständig, überlegte Nividita, ob sie ihrer Mutter an die Gurgel gehen sollte. Alternativ sagt auch ihr Vater ihr gerne, dass er noch echten Rassismus erlebt habe. Doch wenigstens leugnete er nicht, dass es heute noch Rassismus gab. Nur hielt er ihn für minderwertigen Rassismus, so wie er auf das Wort Mikroaggressionen in der Regel mit großen Aggressionen reagierte. Was ist dein Problem mit deiner Mitbewohnerin Lotte? Lotte trägt Bindi, hä? Was soll dein Problem sein? Daran verdienen ein indischer Bindi-Hersteller, dein indischer Bindi-Exporteur, schon mal drüber nachgedacht, hä? Sie hatten noch Angst, auf der Straße zusammengeschlagen zu werden. Damals gab es noch richtigen Rassismus, nicht so einen Sonnenschein-Rassismus wie heute. Nevidita schaute ihn an und dachte an all die Dinge, für die er keine Sprache hatte und hatte keine Sprache, sie ihm zu erklären. Also versuchte sie, sie Priti zu erklären, als sie in der Uni auf die Ankunft von Chadaswati warteten, die wie üblich zu spät zu ihrem eigenen Seminar erschien. Ich, ich wünschte, ich wäre als indisches Mädchen in England aufgewachsen. Dort gibt es wenigstens eine Community und kulturelles Wissen über uns. Während hier, Nividita brach ab, als Preti ihren Ringordner auf den Tisch knallte. You Germans mit eurem kuscheligen kleinen Rassismus. You have no idea about racism, bevor du nach Fascho England kommst. Rate mal, warum ich da weg bin. Germanistan ist ein Puppenhaus dagegen. Und, und was ist mit dem NSU und mit Uri Yallo? wandte Nividita, die in mit Schirm, Charme und Melone Bewunderung für England aufgewachsen war, vorsichtig ein. Like I said, ein Puppenhaus gegen das, was wir jeden Tag erdulden müssen, sagte Priti und sah dabei weder besonders geduldig noch besonders beschädigt aus und auch nicht so, als wüsste sie, wer Uri Yallo oder der NSU waren. Sorry for my generic English accent. That's great. It could also It's be a Dutch different. accent in German, so no, no different. I'll do no, the Thank you. <laughs> One for one. <laughs> Thanks, me too. Um, Alta, do you want to go ahead? I loved it. And I have to say, this is the first time I heard, uh, you know, that I've heard Priti really like speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, aside from on the page. So it's very exciting for me. So we'll see. We'll see how this comes out. Okay. We started, you started with, uh, you know, the, the taxi driver asking where she's from, yeah. right? Okay, just making sure. Okay. Where are you from? Repeated Mehi Ziar as, as she learned from his prominently displayed driver ID. But because these kinds of conversations usually ended with the driver touting his son's suitability as a future husband, Nivedita took a different tack. Poland, she said dryly. You're from Poland? Mehdi asked back. Yep. Poland, Nivedita confirmed. And where's your mother from? Poland, 
From Poland. Yep, Poland. The taxi continued along Hüttenstrasse and soon emerged from the tunnel below the train tracks. Now they were in Ober Oberbilk and she was home. And your father? He's from India, she capitulated. That's an original mixture. She doubted that had played a role in her parents' decision to have a kid. She just couldn't picture them saying, I just love to make the most original mi mixture ever. And anyway, the vast majority of people in the Ruhr Valley had Polish roots somewhere in their family tree. Birgit's maiden name had been Szymanski. As a kid, Nivedita had found that especially ironic since her mother, Birgit Anand, bore zero resemblance to Horst Szymanski, the superstar homicide detective from the TV show Totborg. But the older Nivedita got, it finally clicked when she had her own first boyfriend, the more she realized that that baby blue-eyed, beige, trench coat-clad, trenchant remark-making investigator was precisely the kind of man she found attractive. He was a smoker, like Simon, a drinker, not so much like Simon, and German, like Simon. And the TV show helped Nibidi to solve the puzzle of how Birgit Shimansky and Yagdish Anand had gotten together. Because in Birgit's eyes, Tot or Detective Shimansky wasn't German. I still remember exactly when I first saw him on TV. It was 1979. No, wait, 81. For her, exactly was a relative term. A Polish police detective. You can't even imagine how prejudiced people were against Poles back then. How many Poles does it take to change a light bulb? While you're busy placing your bets, someone will swipe the light bulb. The idea that a pole could be the detective chief inspector instead of just the criminal. I mean, my gosh, we experienced real racism back then. It's so great things aren't like that anymore. Every time Birgit told this story, and it was often, Nivedita wondered whether she should go for the jugular. Of course, her father was also fond of telling her that he had experienced real racism. He'd had such a hard time finding anyone who'd rent an apartment to him that he ended up living in students' quarters until he married Birgit, even though he hated such arrangements. But at least he didn't lie about racism still being a thing. He just thought it was racism light. So every time he heard the word microaggressions, he usually responded with macroaggressions. What's your problem with that flatmate of yours? Lotta, right? So she wears a bindi, huh? What's wrong with that? Her purchases support an, indie bindi, bin, bindi, an Indian bindi maker and an Indian bindi exporter. Did you ever stop to think about that, huh? We went around afraid they'd beat us up in the streets. Back then, there was real racism, not like the shiny, happy racism there is today. Nivedita looked at him and thought about all the things he had no language to express, and she had no language to explain it to him. So she tried to explain it to Priti one day while they were waiting for Shara Swati to show up, late as usual, to her own seminar. I wish I could have grown up as an Indian girl in England. At least there, there's a community and a modicum of cultural, aware cultural awareness of us. Whereas here, but she stopped short when Priti slammed her ring binder on the desk. Ah, all you Deutsche and your cuddly cute racism. You don't know what racism is until you come to fashy England. Take one guess at why I left. Germanistan is a walk in the park compared to where I'm from. What about the NSU? Germany has an actual active national socialist underground. And what about Uri Yalo? Nivita replied somewhat cautiously. She'd grown up enchanted by all the British cliches, umbrellas and derby hats and all that, but tried to temper it and keep herself in check. Like I said, that's all a walk in the park compared to what we have to put up with every day in the UK, Pretty said, although her tone implied she hadn't had to tolerate too much, nor did she sound very traumatized, nor did she seem to have a clue who Ori Yellow or the NSU were. Thanks so much, Alta. <laughs> Thanks, me too, as well. Oh, it's really, yeah, just reading that extract, you just think, poor Nivedita, don't you? <laughs> she gets it from all sides. <laughs> um, you know, like, uh, even her, you know, her dad, you think, oh, maybe her dad will understand where she's coming from. He doesn't understand at all, you know, really, um, her particular position. So it makes sense that Saraswati, the, the, the teacher, becomes this huge, huge figure for Nivedita. Um but, I just want to say, though, because, yes, we could say poor Nivedita, but she does hold her own. Oh, yeah. And there's certain, you know, throughout the book, she makes these remarks. And I think one of the exciting things reading this novel is that 
that you're completely going along with someone or you're completely against someone. And then they say mm-hmm. something and the entire situation turns. Right. So that's, I think, one of the beautiful things about about um, about how this was crafted. And it's also, I mean, this is exploring Nivedita's insecurities, but she she's also writing about her insecurities online. And so her insecurities make her kind of famous in her small little bubble. And so this is also what gives her strength. And she couldn't do that before she met Sharaswati. So it wasn't the strengths before before then. And so in a way, it's <laughs> it's turning full circle. She can't speak about it. And also, I mean, they're all right and they're all wrong at the same time. I mean, her mother has experienced a kind of racism that Nivedita hasn't experienced because she looks at, at her mom and thinks, you're white, you've got no problem. And that's not true if you've grown up being Polish in Germany, uh, really, especially not, not back then, it's, it, it just isn't. And, and Nivedita can't see that in her mother either. So they all do each other wrong. And also they all still keep talking to each other. I mean, they're talking about something that they wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, that's it's so that's amazing, true. by the way, because I've got the American edition and they're, they're, they're different, the English and the American. So they're, they're a couple of sentences are different in the translation. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah. How are they different? Sorry, I'm really curious now. Are they really different? Um, There's this one sentence. um, um, She grew up with um, all the English cliches. Mm -hmm. And um, and here, it's in the Americans, she'd grown up with the Avengers, Emma Peel with her cat Uh, and John Steed with with his umbrellas. (laughs) That's really clever, yeah. (laughs) Which is is actually what's in the original, so that is... um, Yeah. And on oh. some other levels, I prefer the English. So, so both are both both are the best. <laughs> well, I um, think that's one of the exciting things, actually, about both of. I only have the um, I only have the catapult edition of Thousand Coils of Fear. But one of the exciting things about this event was the graphic that you all put together. Um, and I really, you know, it's got like the UK or the 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 British and the UK edition covers, which is, you know covers are not at all they absolutely people we know people judge books by their covers right just like they judge people by their exterior not their interior so it's an interesting just seeing the different cover designs and then I will say and I would imagine Priscilla you can probably speak to this um how much you know it was um uh, anglicized so I know that VNQ did have uh, superb copy editors who, uh, you know, posed some questions and said, because when they when they brought me on board, they knew I was going to do a North American English translation. So, yeah, I unfortunately haven't seen the British edition yet. It's they're sending me a copy, but yeah, I'm I'm curious to see how that went. Uh, yeah. But what was really impressive for me is that you managed to explain things without seeming to explain them. So there are quite a lot of things that every German, or not every, but quite a lot of Germans would understand. For example, who's the NSU? So you don't have to explain anything. And you managed to put that in. So you, you haven't got the feeling there's a subtext there, but you're, you're giving us all the subtext and it's still it's still just jumping. So, so, it's, so it's floating. And that is, I don't know how you did that. And you do a lot throughout the book. Yeah, that was that was a tricky thing about Olivia's novel as well, especially since you've got the East German context. And so writing for an American audience, I thought, okay, not only are they not necessarily going to understand the German context, but the specific East German context, you know, the Trabis and stuff like that. You know, it was it was a real challenge to decide what do you explain and what do you not. And Olivia at one one point said, Oh, they can Google it. You know, I think I was like erring on the side of explaining, um, but I will say um, I'm actually teaching a class right now on the construct of race where I assign both novels and my students have have been able to understand the context in both. So I think I'll tell you, you did a wonderful job <laughs> um, really, you know, explaining the, the stuff that might be harder for students to get. Although I did have to do a whole thing about what Tot Ort is in Shamansky because they had no idea what that was about. I think my gloss there, I think I said something about, you know, the hit television series. And I do think a lot of U.S. uh, or, you know, Anglophone readers will be familiar with it. But it is that fine line. And I think that's where glossing is such a great um, tool in the translation toolbox. Right. Because we don't want to 
Um, I certainly don't want to, you know, go putting the footnotes or the, you know, the all that apparatus. And and it's a it's a fine line to walk between assuming or wanting a reader to bring certain knowledge to it and and knowing that there are other things that they just can't. So I think actually in identity and also a thousand calls of fear, there are lots of different texts that come in. It's very, they're both very inter intertextual. Obviously, in identity, you've got, well, Nivedit is a blogger and you've got the tweets as well. I hope you'll come, come to that, which is amazing, really, the way that the, the tweets, um, I mean, maybe you'll explain how that works. There's a, there's a note at the end of, of the book to explain how you kind of crafted this kind of Twitter sphere just for the novel. Um, but I wonder how you found that as a translating and moving between, um, and also if there's a cause of fear that kind of the, t the texting, the articles, and then you know the different kinds of voices that are coming through there. How you moved between them as you were translating, how you kind of captured that voice, or maybe it just you know, comes naturally. <laughs> I don't know. I think. Um, go ahead, me too. Yeah. So um, maybe just explaining about how the tweets came about, and then <laughs> you can pick up from there. So um, I wanted the internet in the book because there is a shitstorm, obviously, after Sharaswati is debunked as being white. And I wanted the internet as a kind of, A, as a kind of Greek choir, but also um, as this kind of, it, it, there's pressure from there, there are loads of voices. And I can't write the internet, that would just be, <laughs> would be crazy. So um, I thought, wouldn't it be brilliant if I asked people who are active especially on Twitter, because I wanted to use a medium that we might not be using in a couple of years, and that might even be sooner than we thought. <laughs> and so something that really dates the book to a certain time, not, not dates it in a, in a way of, so it's outdated, but you, you, it places it in a certain time, gives it that feel also. Um, because I'm pretty sure all the discussions about race will move on either forwards or backwards, who knows, but they won't stay the same. So uh, this is a kind of time of time capsule as well. And so I asked these people and said, oh, would you donate a tweet for my novel? Like, um, imagine you just read at night on Twitter, you read about a case like Sharaswati's and just tweet, don't think about it, just do it quickly. And I thought, brilliant idea. So I don't have to write them and uh, it's, it's all done <laughs> by, I don't know, magic. Um, the opposite was the case, obviously. So, so everybody kind of either called me and said, I don't understand how, why should I tweet about something that hasn't happened? And I said, no, no, not in the, in the real internet, in the internet, in the book. And then I said, how can I log on to the internet in the book? And it, it took me hours. So each two lines took me hours to explain because the book wasn't there. Now it's there, it's obvious. And people said, oh, you have invented this. I might have invented this because um, Twitter is not, hasn't been around for long enough. So if I hadn't invented it, somebody else would have. And then I, um, and, and then they were so amazing because not only did they all have a different viewpoint, they all had a different language. So all these two liners are, you, you can, I mean, usually you can recognize who, who wrote that, especially in Germany. So the first reviews were like, oh, me too can imitate the voices off. And then um, Fatma Aydemir or Hengamir Bifara or um, René Agiga or all these people are very, very well known in Germany. So no, I haven't imitated them, they've written it themselves. Um, and then I reached out to people who I didn't know, who had been just writing about that on the internet, and they were incredibly generous. So loads of people I basically met after the book was out. And um, so, um, and that is, that is so moving. And that also meant that they trusted me to write about a subject that could be, I mean, I, I could write basically say, oh, why don't you just blackface? It's a good idea. And that, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? And they obviously trusted me enough to do that. And, and so I always think that if you read different kinds of text, so there is um, there are footnotes at the end, but there's also a reading list at the end. So it's <laughs> got a bibliography and all this. So and you approach them and you think this text, because it's footnotes, it tells the truth. And this text, because there's one chapter is told as a um, as a psycho test, as a, as a test in, in the magazine. Um, oh, this is obviously um, just trash. And but it's not so they're all fiction. And so so I like to kind of play with these different um well um different ways we experience text forms and, and different ways we, we encounter texts. And so, so all these texts kind of um, 
are kind of woven into it. I, I would love to use footnotes actually on the on the foot of the page, but then they would have to be something else, not um, as Ipsone said, but it would have to be like kind of somebody else talking and they're talking through footnotes or something. So they had to, it would have to be um, something creative working with the form. The voices yeah. in my head are in the footnotes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We yeah, so there there are extensive um and at least I think in both of these there are there are end notes. And um certainly I that's the the fascinating thing I think um me too is that you know the footnote as part of the writing uh structure and style uh has been extensively explored in english and i think you could have tons of fun with it in fact i hope you kind of do that in the future i know you have a lot that you're writing at the moment and to come um but i didn't i didn't oh you've got to recommend books for me i know just before it does a lot with footnotes and that's very very funny but if you have got anything where they use the footnotes i'd really like to be inspired oh i mean the first thing that comes to mind is david foster wallace you know um of course yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So but I think one one of the things and, and that's a lot of, uh, you know, in terms of talking about literature and translation, um, that the element of we don't want the person to fall out of the narrative story. Right. You've, you've constructed both of both of these um, original the the original novels in German are so absorbing that we want to keep people in there. And so the end notes are there if you if you want them or need them, but they're not necessarily essential to it. Um, yeah, Ellen Ed, was I supposed to answer a question? Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> There's a lot in between. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I was I was asking about you know how you can translate basically that the kind of the tweets, the blogs, and then you know the main narrative was that. How did you find that, find that process as a translator? Were you really kind of was it was it difficult? Was it a challenge, or was it just come naturally in the way that you went about translating it? I suppose that that was the question, both you and Priscilla. Yeah, I think I would say for me it was fun, certainly challenging. I don't know that I have anything articulate to add about the translation process. I mean, certainly I was aware that some of the very well known figures who were tweeting, I did as I went through <clears throat> when there was an actual person tweeting. Um, and I knew I was like, okay, the German reader will know that this is an actual person. As soon as this is in English, the, we cannot presume the original, uh, or the, the English language reader will understand that this is a real person. So I think there was a, and, and it, there was no hard and fast rule that I could use, but sometimes, you know, I had to signal when it was, and I would say, I think roughly, and I know me too, this is your, your, your German version has uh, varied with each reprint because you're in what, probably your 15th or 16th reprint at this point. <laughs> yeah, I knew you were in 13th a while ago, but it's, I mean, this is so many people are reading this book and you've got so many opportunities. It's, it's very, very organic. Uh, whereas with, with the English, I think, you know, I certainly had to look up, uh, you know, there were ones that I knew and then the way the originality with which me too played with um creating the twitter handles um it was important to me to get the humor there um and then of course we all know like it, independent of language you know who the troll is right or who the trolls are in this case um so it was it was it was mostly fun yeah and i would think um i i want to just uh really shout out to um you know Olivia and, and and Priscilla for your work. What really struck me about reading A Thousand Coils of Fear is the use of, and I think what makes would make it difficult to as an audiobook version, is the brilliant use of uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the the bureaucratic, you know, the filling out the forms, and that has a a, a small role, but it's not nearly um, it's that that is used to great effect in A Thousand Coils of Fear, so. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Alta. I'm glad that that came through. Yeah, for me, that bureaucratic language, um, it, on the one hand, it reminded me of going through customs, you know, also when I come back to the U.S., you know, filling out that form, but also like my experience with German bureaucracy, which unfortunately I have also a very recent incident, you know, it, it doesn't matter how long I've been going to Germany or how much, how well I can speak German, Dealing with bureaucracy is a whole other thing. Um, but yeah, to get back to your question, um, Alinette, about um, 
the voices. Um, I was just thinking, you know, the different characters in the book. There's, you know, the narrator, there's her deceased brother, there's Kim, uh, you know, her mother, her grandmother. Um, and what I would say is that I think Olivia did a wonderful job of um, just portraying complex characters, you know, really humanizing them. And I think because she did such a good job of making them like fully fleshed, you know, human beings, it was easier for me to kind of think myself into their heads um, and like empathize with them. And, and I feel like the book is so much about relationships. Um, it, it got me interested in the genre of auto fiction and like relationality. And I feel like so much of it is about the narrator and her relationships to other people and kind of how her identity or subjectivity is constructed to, through that. So I think thinking about that helped me with, with those other voices. And there's an, an interesting tie to her earlier work. So that play that she did, um, Mais in Deutschland, um, there, there's a similar storyline, but the main character would be the brother, you know, so there's the brother, the mother figure, the grandmother. So knowing that work also helped me figure out, okay, what kind of people are these? So. Yeah, I mean, I you mentioned, just, sorry, carry on. Yeah, I've just looked it up and, and her book was out a year before mine. And that's amazing because I have the feeling that had changed so much and, and it had been there for a long, long time. There was a year, that is incredible. It was a particularly long year. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> A lot was happening. <laughs> but to, to sort of riff off of what Priscilla mentioned, I think, I do think it really bears saying, um, well, first, I want to observe just, I think, I feel like I've already said this to me too, but, um, you know, when I've been speaking to people about this particular project, um, not just German speakers, but English speakers and speakers of other languages, one of which I translate from, not going to name names. It's interesting to me that one of the first questions is always, yeah, I heard about that book, but I mean, is it a good book? Like, is it worth reading? And I just, I have to say that because I think there's a part of, you know, there's this idea of, of work in translation of it being this, you know, special thing. And it's like, it's just, they're just fucking great stories. Okay. <laughs> like, and then, okay. If you have a problem with this, with this notion <laughs> of identity, identity issues like it's put a lot of people on guard and I mean thank you Priscilla for reading like the election day thing because I, I I have this incredible I mean on top of like my jet lag from having just traveled it's also election day and it's it's incredibly nerve-wracking because of what's what's going on so um it's I'm just so thrilled um and I was so thrilled to be involved in, in bringing this book into English but I do okay to get back to what Priscilla said about the how well the characters are constructed it is absolutely when I was reading the um my first read through of identity I was like some of them I knew exactly I was like I could hear the voice I knew exact I knew the tone I knew the cadence with which Nivedita was speaking I knew where she was being you know clever and ironic um and then other characters I think took a little bit longer for me to find but I think and this is also I think both an element of both of these both of these novels is um and that takes particular attention in translation is establishing the age differences the power differences the hierarchies the the class differences um some i mean they're very directly addressed in by characters in identity but um they do require care and attention that i think it would be easy for me to just say oh no you know i love it was fun to translate but i do think but part of me, I can't, I can't actually consciously think about it, you know, while I'm working on it. It's that's part of like you do it, and then in the revisions, and talk about it with the editors or with the author to make sure that that we're doing it justice. I think we're very, very quickly, rapidly coming to the section where we opening up for questions from the audience. So please do put your questions in the Q and A. I have like several more questions. <laughs> I'm already running out of time, but um, but please do put your questions in the Q and A. Um, I love to. We'd love to hear them. Um, and really, I don't know. I was thinking about picking up maybe on a comment you made, Priscilla, about auto auto fiction and autobiography, because I think it does play a role really both in both novels, doesn't it? A blurring line. Um. 
Well, me too, you can tell us maybe <laughs> if it does play a role or not. It really is not auto fiction. It is, <laughs> no, it is no. a novel. I it's not, it definitely is a novel. I'm not any of the people. It is yeah. obviously near so the themes are very very near to me mm. but there is um i think there's one autobiographical scene in it where anivadita meets her um her a friend's therapist and the therapist says oh you're from india indian people can breathe so well they can do breathing so natural and <laughs> And, and she she nearly <laughs> she, she can't get done can't get any air she, <laughs> that's the only autobiographical scene in the whole book so to speak because that was that was the difference so new editor is half my age um Shadisati is much more my age but I'm, I'm really not her um and so yes i am obviously all the characters but when i in, in germany the book was always kind of introduced as me to zanyal's auto fictional novel and oh, really was it that yeah yeah, yeah. And, that is, and that yeah. is kind of yes um, there are loads of things I can talk about and they're related to my life, so being mixed race and, and what that entails and, and that was important to me, but but I'm not the people in the novel. Mm -hmm. They've just got similar, some of the, some of the characters have got similar problems or, or not to mine. Mm, yeah. Well, yeah, that's really that's really interesting. Olivia that. does it in a in, Olivia goes the other way, and so so in a way she's incredibly daring to to go autobiographical, and so that's a that's a different way of speaking, and that gives the novel also um, the punch. And I don't know, I don't, and I would really like to ask you that because um, talking to you, these are just novels they're lovely novels and 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 fine, but they are novels. People understand what it's about when when. Um, Olivia's novel was published in Germany. People were really sitting there and they did not know what to make of it. They were really kind of bowled over, but but they couldn't place it. And, and she was asked again and again, but is it real literature? And that was, when my novel came out, I was asked, is that real? Lovely book, fine. They're so happy you're writing about this, but is it real literature? By by interviewers, by by, by literary critics. And, and so in, in Germany, this is kind of, but these aren't our stories. These aren't the stories we tell. I mean, yes, yes, they are actually. <laughs> They're not that special, really. It it's interesting that you bring that up, Mithu. Um, I mean, this idea of like what is real literature is something I deal with constantly as a German professor, you know, and I I work on more contemporary stuff. Um, so you know, it's it's something, yeah, in grad school, you know, dealing with the canon, um, uh, something I've had to think about a lot. But then I think, you know, what about pop literature? You know, what about literature of the 80s, you know, Rolf Dieter Blinkmann or the 90s, you know, Christian Kraft and that sort of thing. So I feel like they're they're are novels that kind of there is a kind of pathway you know to to what it is that you do in identity it, it's not like completely different it's not that not like everything has been Goethe you know in the last <laughs> hundreds of years so yeah for me I wonder if it's this like tendency I don't that's kind of gatekeeping of what is German literature you know and then as soon as someone who is uh you know um you know, biracial, non-white, you know, write something, suddenly it's, oh, but can we really count this? Um, so yeah, that, that I'm, for me, I'm shocked to hear all that. I, I feel like um, the people in the States, at least the Germanists in the States got, got it immediately and, and really loved both of the books. So I found it really interesting to hear about the reception because I, I wouldn't have, when I read A Thousand Calls of Fear, I just thought this is a really brave contemporary novel, hugely literary. To hear you say that, me too, is really, it's a really su surprising to me <laughs> that that wouldn't be your, your, well, not always the first reaction to it. Um, but we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A, so let me have a look. Um, so the first one is from Ailey Johnston. Uh, me too. How does it feel? How did it feel to hand over your novel to a translator? And were you involved in the translation process? Um, well, so I had the experience before. So I translated the the nonfiction book that I had written before that. That's a cultural history of rape, and I read the the first chapter. So the trial um, <laughs> translation, and I was shocked because the voice was a different voice, and and. I, I'd worked a long time on the voice because I didn't want to reproduce the trauma. By the way, I was talking 
So I didn't want to have a book that felt very heavy, heavy and you go out of it and you're really sad. I wanted you to be empowered without making fun of victims. So, so that was really, <laughs> that took a long time. And then the translation was, now we're talking about a serious subject. And then I decided to translate it myself and I thought, brilliant, the book's there. I've just got to write it down. So I'll go a lot quicker. And it took me exactly the same time it took me to write the book, <laughs> to translate it. And I knew I could, I wouldn't be able to, I could not translate a novel. I could not translate a literary novel. Um, and I didn't want to do that to the novel. <laughs> so <laughs> I might have been able to translate it, but it wouldn't be a good novel. And and for me, it was amazing because um, the first extract that I read from Alter, um, she took liberties. She wasn't, I thought the best translation is the one that is as close to the text as possible. And with Alter's translation, it was actually the opposite, that the more liberty she took, the nearer it was to the text, the nearer it was to the kind of um, <laughs> essence of the text. No, it's nothing essential in there. Um, to the kind of voice I'd, I'd imagined to hear. And, and so on some level, I basically said, oh, I trust you completely. You do that. You go as far as you like to go. And you wrote this amazing translator's um, 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 is, it a, is it a foreword? Is it a postscript? It's a postscript, isn't it? And and there you kind of picked up the language of the novel, but you you did your own thing with it, and I absolutely loved that. And so and that showed me how much you understood the process of writing the novel. So it was kind of like you 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 you've, you've been living in my head and <laughs> and doing this. And sure, it is it is every time like um, it's got a different rhythm to my original. So um, I can't read from the English because I've got the German rhythm, and so I know when to breathe and and when it goes faster and when it goes slower. And so rhythm is for me incredibly important. So I'm I do have obviously I have metaphors and and jokes and all this, but the most important is the rhythm. So that one. One sentence basically flows into the next one seamlessly and you you can't stop because you you go along with the breath and and it's a different breath it, it goes along it flows but it's a different breath and that was really hard when I read and I'm, I'm quite glad that we didn't work too close to it uh, together because I might have then gone but this sentence a little bit and, and that would have destroyed the whole thing because I would have gone very very uh, like like um with a magnifying glass and uh, that is not always good yeah magnifying glasses are great <laughs> but I think I also want to register just as a translator I was terrified going in because I knew I was like she's an amazing writer in German and she's fluent in English and this could just be disastrous right like if we made different decisions so I think it was uh I was very lucky in that you did uh you sort of encouraged me or allowed me to take certain liberties that's it is I think you know I, I can never set a hard and fast rule of, oh, you know, I, th I think people have this notion of literal translation of, you know, not word by word, but, oh, well, it has to reflect in this. And people always, especially with German, I don't know if you got this, Priscilla, but people are always like, oh, yeah, how do you, how do you handle that? verb come all the action happening at the end of the sentence <laughs> like, it well, doesn't it's not true this is just such a <laughs> myth about it's, it's like some it's i don't know yeah there's some i was like it doesn't actually work that way and it's that's not a problem at all but um i think that that's a case of you know readers having just enough sort of rudimentary knowledge or misinformation is the case maybe to make presumptions right um which i think brings us right back to the whole identity thing um of just you know yes it's moments of reflection but it's also moments of projection so uh yeah i was terrified going into this uh it was it's such a great book that i do want to say it translated itself uh i guess it didn't i probably did probably did type out every single word of that. Um, and in terms of the postscript, I just felt like it was such a, a powerful and the, the voices were so powerful in the original that how inappropriate, and I don't want to say it would be a violation, but I almost felt like, you know, having a really cut and dry translator's note at the end, it just would have felt off, off key, off tone to me. So I had to I not, ha uh, yes, I was sort of compelled to 
play with the language. And luckily, you know, Me Too was 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 crafty enough. And I mean that in the best sense of the term with her original that I could riff on that and use it to talk about what translation is in an indirect way, I think, hopefully. And I was mm-hmm. thrilled that thrilled that V&Q picked that up, that they wanted to print the whole thing, not just the, you know, the sort of, yeah. you know, by the way, the Jordan Peterson and this is inserted into a completely fictional setting. Yeah. Oh yeah, Jordan Peterson also turns up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I watched hours and hours of Jordan <laughs> Peterson. No, poor you. That was one of the, the yeah the 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 hazardous the 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 hazards of the profession is having to steep myself in the same things. Me too. That you did. <laughs> Actually, there's there's one more uh, question on the Q and A. Um, so it's by Rebecca DeWald, and she asks, "Could you talk a bit about the titles, please?" Uh, identity which doesn't even make it clear on how to pronounce it and a thousand calls of fear are cryptic and open to multiple interpretations are they meant to reflect the impossibility of pinning down the protagonist's identities as clearly one thing or another so thanks for that question Rebecca I don't know who wants to take on that question first Priscilla sure um yeah I'm trying to think if if we had other possible translations in mind we may have thought of saying a thousand serpentines of fear I don't remember but I think coils of fear stuck pretty early on and in my understanding part of part of me sees it as yeah what what you said um this idea of not being able to pin down an identity because I feel like so much of the book is about the idea of identity as something fluid uh, that's constantly changing and depends on you know multitude of factors um I also feel like it picks up the, the kind of the theme of mental health and anxiety that comes up in the text. Um, So yeah, for me, there are just some, yeah, a lot of different ways that the coils resonate, but yeah, it is. I, oh, okay. I think we may have debated having angst in the title because, because of keeping something German, but the problem is in English angst is, is understood as like something completely different than fear. So unfortunately that wouldn't have worked, but um, yeah, now that I think of it, it's kind of an ambiguous uh, title and hopefully, hopefully it just makes people curious and they pick it up and read it. Um, so I didn't choose the title identity. So identity is Nivedita's Twitter handle. So, or, or blogger name. So she blogs about identity politics and tits, so sex not sexual poly, mainly sex. Um, and um, and and I want, what did I want to call the book? I have very, very uh, literary titles, so not with us and not without us and something like that. And I also, said, yeah, that is very worthy. But why don't you call it identity? Because everybody calls it identity anyway. Um, I also like that um, identity, it, it does sound like a word, it is a word play of uh, identity anyway so I think I had Francis Fukushima's book on the toilet and um, the identity book and so I was looking at that in the morning and uh, my eyes went quite clear and I thought this is a brilliant Twitter name and I noticed no it's just um, <laughs> I just couldn't read it properly um by the way that's the way my the the cover of the Wolver book came about because it was the, uh, a photo in a, in a newspaper and I saw it on the toilet and I said I want this <laughs> image so very creative place to be toilets play a very important part in the book as well by the way only one toilet um and I, I did like this um, at that time. Nobody was talking about identity politics when I was writing the books. It was very kind of dry and um, dusty. So, so nobody's used that word for a long, long time. So I thought I'd take something dry and something sexy. <laughs> By the time the book came out, it was the other way around. Nobody was interested in sex. Everybody was talking about identity politics. That was the hottest item on the menu. Um, and, and that was interesting how fast that turned around. And now, I kind of like that identity also makes fun of identity politics, but in a in a kind of sexy way. And in the book, it's also that Nivedita's um, boyfriend or ex-boyfriend, on and off boyfriend, um, and he's he makes fun of her and says, "Oh yeah, you and your identity," because he um, he doesn't. Well, I, I I think he does understand what it's about, but he's kind of jealous, so he has to make it smaller because he he isn't part of that world. So he he's white, but there are loads of white people around who are part of her world, but but he definitely isn't, and he doesn't want. 
he, he, he can't deal with anything that's important in her life that's not him. So he really doesn't like Sharaswati. <laughs> Sharaswati doesn't like him. <laughs> so there can only be one. And I'll say for the English language title, I, and I'm pretty sure the sample I first sent, I was like, this has to end with a Y. I mean, the titty part, and it's right in the first few pages. I was like, titties have to be in here. So it has to be identity. And it, it was also, you know, having the reader sort of look at it and be like, is that a typo? The two T's. Um, but I do think some of the decision in terms of keeping the spelling, the title the same, spelled the same way as, uh, you know, I think there was one of the uh, one of the voices that came up in this chorus of, of, of bringing this into English was, um, oh, you know, people might think it's some Indian goddess they haven't heard of, right? Like <laughs> Kali is pretty recognizable, but maybe identity. And I was like, mm, it doesn't look like that to me, but okay, maybe an English language reader would see that. Um, but what I like about having kept the spelling is that let me as the translator in my translator's postscript use the why, right? And so the Twitter shitstorm that happens in the translator's postscript is responding to, you know, people are speculating that Nivedita has just changed her Twitter handle, changed the I to a Y um, to disguise herself to get out of this, you know, mess that's happened in the preceding novel. So I, that was something I could play with. Um, but that is so interesting because I wanted to spell it as a Y in English, and um, my my husband, who is who's British, said no, but you would you would spell it with an I and not with a Y, and and I didn't understand, but he he was absolutely adamant. No, no, that's all right. <laughs> I want the tits to be audible. Yeah. <laughs> But can we also, I mean, I feel like me too, you and I in, in other presentations of this, we've come up, uh, we've stumbled upon this notion that, of uh, you know, part of one's identity is how one's name is pronounced, right? Oh, and, yeah. Uh, titles and names and um, you've been told that you pronounce your name incorrectly. People but, are oh, always worried. And so, is, so does Nivedita. So in India, Nivedita would be pronounced Nivedita. But because she's in Germany, she is pronounced Nivedita. So I pronounce her Nivedita because that's the way she's addressed. And so she hasn't even got the authority about uh, over her own name. And it isn't a coincidence that I can't pronounce my own name. So I didn't grow up speaking my father's language. And um, I did a feature about father tongues. So why do you, you might learn your mother's language if it's not a white language you might not but if it's your father's language the probability that you learn it are so 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 minute and I, mm -hmm. I I interviewed loads of people about their father languages their father tongues and and all of them they all had a bad conscience for not having learned it even though it was the other way around they were they, they weren't taught it so that it was taken away from them and they felt like they had done something wrong like as a baby they said don't don't talk to me in this weird weird language go away no of course not they haven't and so um in a way there are certain sounds that i can't produce now it's really hard for me to hear them properly because i haven't grown up with them so it's a very funny feature it's it's still online where you can hear me and us and um i say me too and, and and my teacher says no your name is not me too it's me too and i said me too and no 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 you're wrong <laughs> and it's on and on and on and i can't hear the difference <laughs> Oh, that's really interesting. Oh, thank there was another too. author. She's from Bengal. So, so she's oh, right. half Bengali as well, like, like I am. And she couldn't hear it either. But she, she's, <laughs> she's living in Germany too. So that was kind of a relief. Oh, yeah. Not just that's me. Right, not just you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for the questions, um, Ailee and uh, Rebecca. And unfortunately, we're, we've run out of time. It's almost quarter past eight. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have any time for more questions. And in fact, I feel like we have a lot more to discuss. <laughs> but uh, and we already got to the end end of the session. Um, so left to me just to tell you that meet the um, the um, German translation uh, advanced German translation workshop continues this week, and there's lots of other um, events happening this week. Um, publishers panel German literature and translations happening tomorrow at half past three. Um, the BCLT research seminar, uh, what translation can tell us about the Holocaust is tomorrow as well. And, um, and what's and all sustaining a career translation is happening on Thursday, but all the details of that are on uh, the website, National Centre of Writing and, uh, website. So, and uh, the British Centre of Literary Translation website, I should say. 
Um, so I just want to, again, thank you all for wonderful panelists for your really interesting discussion. Um, as I say, I feel like we talk a lot more, but um, thank you so much for talking about translation, about identity, about your about your novel, Me Too. Um, and I really, 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 um, yeah, really, for anyone who has not read these novels, please go away <laughs> and read them because they're really, I read them the last few weeks, and I can't stop thinking about them. They're really fantastic. Um, and thank you for to uh, Kate Griffin and to Ali Reeves and Martin and Anna Good um, for organised behind the scenes organisation of the event. And again, to BCLT, the Goethe Institute, uh, New Books in German and National Centre for Writing for bringing it all together as well. So thank you, uh, everyone. And I hope you all have a lovely evening. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Thank you. I'll be going to yeah. bed now with Priscilla, with you <laughs> as a fictional character in the book I'm reading at the moment. That's so amazing. <laughs> I hope it doesn't cause you any nightmares. <laughs> no, that's a lovely, it's a it's a lovely graphic novel and she's the main character. It's such a great. <laughs> what's, the, what's the title? Are we on? Root, what's the title? Girl. Root, Root Girl. Root Girl. I'm going to have to look this up as well. <laughs> Thank you.